I doubt it. I highly doubt it. Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back to another episode. And man, we are coming off the first ever NBA Cup. It was... I. I, I loved it. It was it was all everything I thought it would be. It was fantastic. LeBron James is now the youngest person ever to win the MVP of the NBA Cup. I read that somewhere this morning and got a chuckle. Uh, a lot to break down there. We'll talk about Anthony Davis and, and his final game performance and see where we go from there. Cody, how are you feeling? Man, that... Honestly, like, I'm surprised there hasn't been a quote that's come out where LeBron's like, ever since I came in the league... You know, it was 2005, and I just dreamed of winning the NBA Cup MVP. Like, I've been thinking about this ever since I was a young NBA player. I'm surprised that quote uh, hasn't come out yet. Something that you just said that makes me really happy that I was starting to get annoyed by was they, mo- like, the NBA mostly refers to it as the in season tournament. Um, it needs to be the NBA Cup. We need to pick one or the other, right? I'm, I'm sick of the in season tournament. It needs to be called the NBA Cup. That's the only thing, though. Everything else, 10 out of 10, blew my expectations out of the water. That final game was incredible. The elimination games ruled. Ben, I was wrong. I was incredibly wrong about all of it, and I loved every second of it, and I genuinely can't wait till we can have this tournament every NBA season. See, is there anything better than being wrong and loving something? It's just the You're like, this movie's going to be terrible, and then you go in, and it's it, Barbie's your favorite movie ever. Well... <laughs> <laughs> I do think that movies genuinely turn out to be better when you go in with like low expectations. Like it's those kind of movies. It's the movies where you walk in, you're like, this is gonna change my life when you're like this it's not quite it. Barbie I went in with high expectations and still blew it out of the water. That's a that's a different it's a different conversation. That's impressive. We're already getting vulnerable here to start the show. It's it's uh it's fantastic. Um I also wanna talk the other thing that we want to get to today is just from the in-season tournament, uh, sorry, from the NBA Cup final, this bully ball and the size of the Lakers and just are all the top teams like really big? Is that what's going on now? So we're going to get to that. But Cody, first, we have to start with Los Angeles. We have to start with the Lakers. They had a great performance. Uh, We have a video on the Thinking Basketball YouTube channel about it. And this is what I'm thinking, okay? Anthony Davis, does he actually have one of the highest peaks in NBA history? And and it's a little weird because traditionally when we talk about the best players ever, we talk about a season or multiple seasons and playoff runs and, you know, great 82 games. And Anthony Davis to me is not a player who's really ever exhibited the ability to dominate 82 games. He's not the kind of player who year after year is going to put up huge numbers, lead a championship offense, lead a championship defense, destroy the regular season, get to the playoffs, have four great series, and it's just a matter of how good the team is around him. That's not what we're talking about, even though it's traditionally what I think happens. Because with Davis, this guy in a single game, a single series, a single stretch, just dominates basketball games and and matchups like so few people do. And in today's NBA, Cody, where the playoffs are all about matchups, we saw this in the NBA Cup, single elimination, just get to the finals with the Pacers, cook up a game plan around Anthony Davis, and you're good to go. And oh, by the way, he had 40 points and 20 rebounds in the game as well as dominating defensively. Uh, I, what do we make of this? It, it, it's It's weird, right? It's crazy, but also how many players would you rather have when he's on? We're gonna be we're pretty close here to changing the name of the show from thinking basketball to vulnerability in basketball or something like that because that's that's all I feel that we're doing a lot of these times because Anthony Davis to me has the straight like I'm gonna start in nerd corner here for a second Ben I think he maybe has the strangest statistical blueprint not blueprint footprint Ben some kind of print he has the strangest statistical footprint of pretty much any player that I'd be comfortable saying that like game to game can exhibit like. MVP all-time level like tendencies right if you look at you know the three seasons when Drew Holiday Drew Holiday and he were teammates back in uh, New Orleans right Drew Holiday was a starter for only three of those seasons it was a little bit longer but if you look at all of those games where they actually played together when they're on together the net rating's pretty solid it's like a plus six across the regular season but when Anthony Davis is on by himself 
The Pelicans are like a negative four, which is worse than Drew Holiday when they're like a negative two, right? And that's like, okay, fine, three seasons, whatever else. We don't have any other evidence. But we do have other evidence, Ben. We have five seasons now, I guess, including this season, where LeBron James and Anthony Davis have been teammates with the Lakers. And if you look at the on-off numbers of when both of them play in the same game, again, like, their net rating together is fantastic. It's, like, right near plus 10, plus 9, whatever else. But when Anthony Davis is on by himself, again, they're underwater. They have a negative net rating. LeBron James, of course, when he's by himself, there's still, like, a plus 9 because he's probably the greatest quarterback in, in NBA history. And in the playoffs, you know, we're talking about the playoffs a lot here. We're actually talking about the playoffs, Ben. Um... He, it's the same sort of thing. It's maybe a tick higher, but it's still like just around neutral when he's on by himself as a superstar. And a lot of those numbers, you don't see that kind of thing with like these high level players. But then when he's paired with one of his all-star level teammates, they look fantastic. So I don't know. I don't know how to wrap my head around the fact that like game to game, this guy can look completely unstoppable, but also like across a longer time span, especially in the regular season he looks uh, not like a superstar. So that's where I'm going to start because I don't know how to work my way through all of that. I, I think there's no doubt that he's not a player who can just floor raise a team, carry a team to great heights by himself. But what happens when his shot is on? This shot comes and goes, right? He used, he used to have a three-pointer. It was a little, you know, low 30s percentage-wise and whatnot. But he used to be a little quicker, play out on the perimeter. And now it's more the mid-range, what we've seen in the last few years, in the postseason last year. What happens when that sh- shot is on? What happens when he's healthy? What happens when he's engaged? I think that's the fascinating part of the conversation. Because personally for me, I don't care quite as much about what happens when you're out there by yourself simply because no one can really win by themselves. You want to be looking at what happens when you have another star teammate or two star teammates and a good lineup. And for modern basketball, where matchups are huge, where you're saying one series, I want to try one strategy. The next series, I want to try a different strategy. Is there anyone who's more of a Swiss army knife than Anthony Davis? Are you talking about both on offense and on defense here? Well, well, here's the thing, and we'll get to the defense in a second. But on offense, the thing that's so critical to me is that he takes advantage of mismatches. Mm -hmm. So you cannot switch, you know, casually and think you're going to get away with it like if he's Rudy Gobert or uh, Evan Mobley or even Jaron Jackson, and some of the other like top uh, prim- uh, big man defenders in the league. You can't do that because when he's engaged, he will go right to the block. He will have his Bundini Brown, uh, LeBron James, telling him, you know, th- get, get right into that guy's chest. Thro- throw the ball inside, pound him and take advantage of him with your size. And he will do that if you switch, he will do that if you try to play small ball. And so you say, okay, we're gonna we're in the playoffs. We need a different lineup. We're the Golden State Warriors. We're gonna go small and try to use that to our advantage on offense. Anthony Davis is coming right down the court and he's going right to the post and he's either gonna score, draw a foul, or we saw it in the championship game of the NBA Cup. He's gonna start inhaling offensive rebounds. Don't take lightly grabbing four, five, six offensive rebounds in a game because usually that comes with two or three fouls. He fouled out Miles Turner the other night, practically just on the glass, just trying to keep him off the glass, right? And that's the kind of play that allows your teammates to run their set basic offenses. Other guys can eat, and then you go clean it up and turn the possession into a super high-value possession. So that's the part to me, where the offense is connected to the defense. And it's such a big deal in the playoffs because he's like bulletproof. He's, he's, he's almost, uh, sort of scheme proof. There's nothing you can do to take that away. Really. I'm glad you said that because his offense to me seems so inelastic. Like the floor is, it's relatively high. It's not to the point where like, you're going to get a great offense out of it, but it's the type of offense that it kind of doesn't matter 
what sort of defender you put on him down there, he's going to have pretty much the same sort of efficiency, unless there's like a mismatch, and he's able to handle that pretty well. Because like you said, against Miles Turner, you see a couple of these possessions where he just blows by him. When I think when he gets the face-up game from about 16 feet out or so, dribbles, gets a little crossover, and gets to the rim, uh, the extension with his layup or like dunks is just like, if he gets by you, there's no way you're going to be able to catch up to him. Or like you said, like he gets a nice little mismatch in the post, spins baseline, and again, the length. All of a sudden, he's going up around the other side of the back basket and finishing it that way now the double-edged sword of it all though is I feel like the Lakers when I watch them playing offense is there's almost too many sets where the play is like all right Anthony Davis here's your post up here's your iso from 16 feet like we're gonna kind of you know clear out this side of the floor and we're gonna let you cook a little bit and unfortunately cooking for him is shooting 20 percent from long mid-range for the season um which you know don't don't adjust your your headsets or headphones or whatever you listen to he's shooting 20 percent on long mid-range jumpers this season. But this is what jump in this here. is what makes it so weird because when his shot is going, it will go for an entire playoff series or multiple playoff series. We saw this in the bubble, and I think a lot of people attribute that specifically to the bubble setting and it might have contributed to it, but we had the same thing in the playoffs last year where the playoffs started and they play the Memphis Grizzlies and the Golden State Warriors, and he's just he just starts making mid-range shots all of a sudden. And so that is a great point, but how do you weigh that when you're... Tr- Let's say you're trying to win a championship, you're trying to beat the best teams, and you have some decent probability of getting Anthony Davis just smashing 55% mid-range jumpers over elite defenses in the playoffs out of nowhere, while also conceding that most of the time, and especially during the regular season, he could shoot 35% on these shots, and they're like not really good offense. It's really weird. I mean, he's the initial guy. I think this is where he came up bamming bam. Like, I think at one point we were talking about bam bamming other players, but like Anthony Davis in the 2020 finals was absolutely bamming bam. And of course, we were talking about just like how on fire uh, Anthony Davis was with shooting. And I know bam had some kind of an injury in those finals. I don't remember if it was a shoulder, but there was something going on. But like, that was the first time, you know, that was sort of bam's like, oh my goodness, look at this guy. He's DHO God. He's just huge. He's blocking Jason Tatum at the rim. But then Anthony Davis just made him look small. Like, like you said, the offensive rebounds, you couldn't keep him off the offensive glass and bet the lobs. Like, I, I don't know if there's been a better lob finisher in history. And then he, when he's paired with LeBron James, who's, you know, one of the best lob throwers in history or one of the best pocket pass throwers in history, one of the best, you know, again, just half court passers in history. That's a dynamic duo that when you have all of that paired and when you have the offensive rebounds, the rolling to the rim, using his speed, if the jumper's on. Oh my God, like we're talking about like competing for the best player in the league, competing for top three players in the league. But then it's like the other space of it all when it's like, what if all of that stuff's not actually happening? What about <laughs> those playoff games when he has 11 points and seven rebounds and not to just like box score watch, but like that's not 40-20. Like there's going to be with Anthony Davis, he's going to be a bit more valuable if he has 40 points and 20 rebounds as opposed to like 11 points and seven rebounds or something like that. So I, I don't know. I don't know when he is playing that like... I know you had a video about this once upon a time. I don't know the ter- hybrid. I think he's a hybrid big in terms that he's able to play off somebody so well. He's so good at like the, the NBA math of it all on offense is just incredible. But then, you know, you have some of these slow down isolations, which I don't always love. The jumper sometimes leaves him. And then the engagement level isn't always there. So you get this really interesting mix where you have Anthony Davis in offense, Ben. But I think some of those off-ball things and the finishing, I think that's why he pairs so well with other players. And when Drew Holiday is your best teammate, when LeBron James is your best teammate, when you take that passer off the court and you remove that option, you don't get the same offensive synergy. Then, of course, the big area is defense, right? Where he is a Swiss army knife in the playoffs. And let's just review, because I was trying to go over it uh, before we recorded, and I was, I was kind of blown away. 2020 postseason, they go to the bubble. They play the Portland Trailblazers. And in that series, uh, Davis is asked to come out to the level of the screen to deal with Damian Lillard's white-hot pull-up shooting at that time. He was on fire. So he's versatile and mobile enough to do that. Then they go to the Houston Rockets in the next round. In the Houston Rockets series, they cook up a scheme. Remember that was the micro ball, D'Antoni, Houston Rockets, Russell Westbrook. They'll put Anthony Davis on Russell Westbrook. Anthony Davis can guard Russell Westbrook in five out space as the center, 
but then also switch and trap and chase James Harden, and they had this trapping scheme, and then he's on the weak side, and he can make plays on the weak side and recover all over the place. Then in the finals against the Miami Heat, you mentioned it. You need, you need to guard Bam Adebayo? He can do that. Oh, Jimmy Butler's taking over and he's scoring. We'll just switch him on to Jimmy Butler, even though nominally Davis is the center and Jimmy Butler's a small forward, and he can shut down Jimmy Butler and have a transcendent defensive game that way. Last year in the playoffs against the Golden State Warriors, they have this crazy scheme where they're using Davis to catch all the guards and funnel all the guards toward him as they stand on top and push the guards downhill. And that really, really disrupted the Golden State offense. And they went through this whole cat and mouse game of how do we pull Davis out of the paint? And then the Lakers were like, we're not going to involve him in the pick and roll. And it didn't matter. He basically dictated the series defensively because of his presence. Then you go to the Denver Nuggets series. They did not win the Denver Nuggets series, but what do they do in the Denver Nuggets series? They're like, what we're going to do is we're going to have Davis roam off Jokic so he can disrupt the passing lane. And there were a ton of possessions and stretches of that series where that actually worked, where you saw Jokic bothered or committing turnovers that basically no one else in the league can force from him. And Cody, that doesn't even just get into the generalities of the fact that he can play drop coverage. Come down the lane, he'll contest a shot beautifully, very, very high level there. He can switch out on the perimeter against small players, and he doesn't give up anything. And in fact, he can really bother small players in that position. In the championship game against the Pacers of the NBA Cup, we saw him trap and then recover behind the play. It's just like he can play any different coverage that you need to deploy. And when you look at the regular season numbers, The stats don't pop defensively. They're good, but they're not like all time. When you get to the playoffs, they tend to look much better, and I think that's the reason why. That jackknife, the skeleton key aspect of his defense is fascinating here because I think a couple of years ago he was definitely quicker horizontally, but I definitely do – I think like guys like Bam are probably better in isolation defense against like smaller guards, but the thing is, as I'm thinking about it, Well, I guess I was thinking about Miami Heat, for instance. Bam and Jimmy Butler are probably like the two kind of player archetypes that he is just ideal for defending, right? Because if you're going to rely on, you know, maybe you're not necessarily getting to the rim as many times as like a Ja Morant or something like that. Maybe you're going to rely on a pull-up mid-range jumper. He can contest those from giving you some space, and then all of a sudden you pull up, and all of a sudden he's like there meeting you at the apex. It's like, oh my god, where'd this guy come from? And he's just bothering you from all those angles. But then I think about like Damian Lillard, like you were talking about stepping up to uh, to the level and trying to defend him there. Damian Lillard's able to get by him, or at least get like horizontal with him. But Anthony Davis's length and reaction and agility is so much that like he still meets you at the rim. Like he just blocks Damian Lillard at the rim. It's like, oh okay, I'll let you buy me for a second, but here I am again to block you, and. So I don't know. He's not necessarily, like I said, the fastest horizontally, but he has a lot of these other tools that lets him be just, you know, all over the agility, Ben. I'm thinking about the Pacers game again here. I don't remember exactly who it was he was closing out in the corner, but somebody kicks to the corner. Somebody that's one of the Pacers has the ball in the corner, and Anthony Davis, like, jumps out, like, full-blown both hands in the air to chase the guy off the corner, and he jumps out so much that he's, like, kind of caught for a second by the bench, and you're like, wow, Anthony Davis is out of the play. No, Ben! He's (laughs) not out of the play. Anthony Davis runs back to the rim and blocks the other player under the rim. It's genuinely, like, GOAT-level defensive plays like that, where when a player starts making those kinds of plays, you have to start thinking like this is legitimately some of the best defense I've ever seen and that's all you can think the numbers like you said the regular season especially rim protection type numbers that we've been cooking up and looking at they just don't compare to some of the other all-time level rim protectors but then when you watch it game to game and you see how he's bothering some of these other guys I, I don't know, man. Um, the Russell, do you want to talk about his rustling ability, Ben? His ability, it, it, you want to explain what rustling is okay, and how Anthony so, Davis? So Bill Russell used to do this thing where he would jump up and block, you know, contest a shot like he was going to block it with one hand and use the other hand to play the pass. And Anthony Davis does this just about as well as anyone in the league. So he's got great hands. He's He's tracking the ball vertically and then sticks his other hand out horizontally to steal interior passes and kick out passes. It's uh, it's really fantastic. Cody, if you look at the playoff numbers, and the regular season numbers aren't impressive, but in the playoffs, the last five years, there are only a few players allowing 
shooting percentages within six feet of the basket uh, lower than Anthony Davis is allowing when we look at the expected field goal percentage. So Brooke Lopez, Brooke Lopez, excuse me. Let me try that again. Brooke Lopez, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Draymond Green, Joel Embiid are slightly ahead of Anthony Davis at 15 and 14 percent. Anthony Davis, 13 percent below what we expect in the playoffs in the last three years. That's 2020, 2021, 2023 for him. So again, we don't see this night to night, Cody. We don't see this in the regular season. He hasn't always been right or healthy, but when he is healthy, um, I mean, there just aren't that many players or bigs that I think you want when they're on. It may be the entire history of the league over Anthony Davis, and, and it's just such a weird, unique kind of peak in that sense. And I think, like we were talking about, it almost takes certain kinds of teammates to really unlock all that. Like, you can see, like, a really sad alternate universe where Anthony Davis ends up on a team that, like, they're force-feeding him a lot. He's the focal point of the offense. The numbers just don't look great. He doesn't get the chance in the playoffs to really showcase these. And it's just kind of, like, lost to the regular season. But, you know, thankfully, we actually get to see Anthony Davis. And and I know this is going to come up again when we do, you know, we always do our top ten players at the end of the season. And I don't want, like... I don't want the NBA Cup final to bias my thinking like that much where I'm like, well, I saw Anthony Davis drop 40 and 20 in the NBA Cup against Tyrese Halliburton, the guy that finished fifth in MVP voting. Therefore, Anthony Davis is going to finish where. So I don't I really don't know how to grade him out whenever the end uh, end of the season comes. But the fact of the matter is what we saw on Saturday night shows that Anthony Davis still has it. Like, whatever it is, like, it is still there. And I think that makes the Lakers quite a bit more potent than it might seem like they are on a game-to-game basis during the regular season. Was that, was that like, your – is that your grumpy old man voice? Is that what that was when you were complaining about the NBA Cup influencing your voting? I'm going to be completely honest with you right now, Ben. Like, I just went into a trance, and that just came out of me. If you asked me to repeat, like, even the general idea of what I just said – I don't have a clue. I don't have any idea what I said. That was just that that came from deep, like in the soul. Then this does this doesn't have anything to do with the quad injury, does it? Oh my god! I think that's actually why my body just breaks, why my joints just break down. Is I think I'm haunted in like in like Ben Ben. I don't know if this sounds cocky or what, but like if I were to be good enough to be a professional athlete, I would definitely be the guy that would miss like. 50 games a season i would like randomly miss an entire season it just it doesn't work my body doesn't work at that level of competition this is why you have to love bill walton this is what you, you he's someone who actually got to live for the brief moment uh for those of us who are chronically injured and our bodies are not designed to handle high levels of stress that you can give them when when you get older uh anyway what, what were we talking about cody big people anthony davis bamming bam yeah i I don't know, Ben. Uh, do you have any other things to say about Anthony Davis? Do you want to talk about like general bigs in the league, or do you have like a final Anthony Davis point to make? No, I think I think the takeaway coming out of the game was that the Lakers are still very big, and that size was something that Indiana had to feel. I, I mean, heck, the Pelicans game started. And as the game, I know we did our prediction. I, oh my God, the predictions, Cody. We did. We, for, we forgot. We forgot the predictions. Oh, Co- I did not forget my. Predictions. Yes. So Cody, ladies and gentlemen, uh, absolutely nailed the end of the NBA Cup with his predictions. Cody, can you remind everyone what your uh, percentages were? Oh my God, what my percentages were! I know yeah. I said I said extreme Pacers confidence, eighty twenty for sure. Mm-hmm. Like that, I was so sure I should have went one hundred percent. I knew the Pacers were going to beat the Bucks in that game. I think I had the Lakers over the Pelicans like fifty five forty five. I wasn't quite as positive about that. I don't remember what I said about the finals. Did you write that down? I wrote it down somewhere. Uh, okay. It doesn't seem to be in our official prediction tome that we keep around these parts. But uh, Cody absolutely nailed both the semifinals and the finals, calling the LeBron James shot. And I- I'm trying to find the numbers. They're, they're, they're gone. They're gone. All I know is that I was 11 points ahead going in, and yet you absolutely uh, have moved into the lead by predicting the Lakers correctly. And w- the thought that made me think of that was when the Lakers game started with the Pelicans, you could see... Anthony Davis's presence 
just kind of like kind of like laughing over the idea of Zion Williamson attacking the basket. It's just like it's like Zion has all this space and he's dribbling and he's looking for his spots. And that was a fun matchup with old Zion. With this year's Zion, that was not a fun matchup. That was like you are not going to eat anything all night long. Um a- Anthony Davis just shut off that well. Nothing was happening there for the Pelicans, and I think it was a big problem throughout the night. And so, yes, Cody, this idea of size is something that I've been noticing. Let, let me break it down this way. The 2023 NBA title was won by the Denver Nuggets. That's a huge team. Jokic, Aaron Gordon, Michael Porter Jr. front line Jamal Murray is their point guard. He's like 6'4", barefoot, something like that. He's a big guy. Jamal Murray blocked Anthony Davis in a conference finals uh, game last year. 2021 NBA championship. Your Milwaukee Bucks. Giannis Antetokounmpo, Brooke Lopez, Chris Middleton, Drew Holiday is your point guard. That is a big team. That is a huge team. Okay. 2020 NBA championship, the aforementioned Lakers, they could go, they were a big team as well. Alex Caruso, KCP, Danny Green, these, these were the starter, uh, starting guards that would bring Kuzma in. They could start Anthony Davis at the four, LeBron James at the point. They could go quote unquote small with Anthony Davis and LeBron James. Huge team. Even the 2019 Raptors were pretty big with Siakam and Sergi Baca, and Marc Gasol, and Kawhi Leonard, Danny Green, again. They're a pretty big team. And that size played a role in the finals, right? That size on the offensive glass, or just making things difficult defensively, you could feel it in the finals. Golden State was much smaller. And I skip Golden State, because they've won all the other championships, basically, in this time. They won in 2022, and then, of course, they had the, the dynasty before that. And during the, you know, those years, 2014, 2016, 2018, there was this radical shift in basketball. We may be coming out of it, this incredible evolutionary period with space and shooting and pace and skill ball. And a lot of people said it's small ball, right? You want a lot of forwards. You want to be able to mimic what Golden State's doing. I think Golden State is looking more like the white swan here, or the black swan, the black swan, excuse excuse me, Uh, because Golden State, they got Steph Curry. They got Curry and Klay Thompson together on the same team to amplify each other. They have Draymond Green, one of the great defensive players ever, who also happens to be super versatile, who's small, and they happen to get a bunch of forwards, like even just getting Andre Iguodala at that point in his career being able to bring him into that lineup or bring him off the bench. I think that's the unique thing. And I actually think the move has been in the league toward getting smarter and getting more skillful and understanding how to have the right strategy. And that does not mean getting smaller. And so if you can be skillful and you can have the right strategy and you're bigger, that's still better than being skillful and having the right strategy and being smaller. And I have more to say about this, but I'll stop there because that's kind of where my brain has been for a while. And, and the NBA Cup just like hit me right in the front of the face with it again. Well, Tyrese Halliburton agreed with you. Like he, he was talking after the game and he said something like, uh, you know, every team doesn't have AD and a bunch of six, eight wings. Felt like Braun and AD never came off the floor. Makes me want to play more games that have some meaning to them. I, I like that ending part. I just added it in there. But he agreed with you. Like the Lakers just seemed really big. And I'm thinking about this like period of time that you're talking about, this weird like 2015 to maybe 2019-ish period. And I don't necessarily know like how much we should actually consider that to be like an epoch of the NBA. Because I feel like right before that, right, we have a couple of finals where like, you know, you have the Lakers there that's starting like Pau Gasol and Andrew Bynum out there. And even Kobe Bryant's a big like two guard out there. And Lamar Odom's coming in. He can play the four. And then Dwight Howard makes it to the five. Dwight Howard weirdly enough, sort of ushered in a small ball-ish sense, you know, because Stan Van Gundy throws out, like, Rashard Lewis playing. I mean, he was a bigger dude, but he played at the wing. Hito and, Hito and Rashard were, like, 6'10". And that's this is true. this is small ball. I think that's you're fair. right. It kind of did usher in this small ball era, but when you look back, 
you have Howard, Hito, and Richard Lewis at the front line, and this is a huge... And if you're playing Michael Petras or Mikhail Petras at the two guard in some of those lines, like, those are huge lineups. And so I'm trying to think, like, during this time, was it the fact that we kind of went away from big men? Or was there just not that many, like, good offensive big men from, like, 2013 to, like, 2018? Because, like, I, I'm not trying to be mean here. I'm genuinely not trying to be mean. You know, yes, I'm not going to yes, say, yes, I'm not gonna yes. say <laughs> listen, listen, Ben, I'm not going to say any names. I'm just not. But look at the centers that make the all-NBA teams between, like, 2014 to, like, 2018. Just go, somebody go, look at some of those names, and come back to me. Like, none of those guys are going to be, like, defense-busting types of players. Like, you're not going to change the way you play to try and stop what they're doing. And then all of a sudden, right after that, like, Anthony Davis starts hitting his peak. Uh, uh, I just tried to combine like five different names. <laughs> Nikola Jokic starts hitting his peak. Joel Embiid starts hitting his peak, and then all of a sudden, everyone's starting to follow into that. So I don't, I don't necessarily know. Even those Heat teams that kind of went small, like small ball for the Heat was like LeBron at the four, but then they still had like Shane Battier at the three, and some of those lineups had like Ray Allen at the one because LeBron's just kind of a point guard. So I'm not necessarily sure if we ever went away from having big skilled players out there. I just think there was this weird time in the NBA when everyone just collectively referred to small ball. And the only team that could actually pull it off like perfectly was the Golden State Warriors because Draymond Green is just like an enigma that could play like the four and the five. And Steph Curry is just like a god of shooting. And then everyone just tried to respond to that, but nobody could replicate it because Steph Curry and Draymond Green are like the two perfect players for playing that sort of style. Yeah, no, that's that. That's what I'm thinking uh, seems to be the actual emerging reality of that period. And if you look at the teams right now, I, I just ranked them just so just so we don't have any you no know, bias. I will still be accused of bias. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> but you are very biased about many things, but I, we don't know. Okay. I ranked them by wins. In order of wins right now, the Minnesota Timberwolves are first. They are playing Twin Towers. They are basically playing two centers. The Milwaukee Bucks are playing basically Twin Towers. Giannis Antetokounmpo is huge. He can play the five in this league. He's six eleven, right? And I think, and Cody, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get ahead of you. I'm gonna get ahead of you because I know how you think. I know how you, I know your questions that are always coming. We're on the we're on, we're on vibing now. We're on the same wavelength. I know what you're gonna ask. You're going to ask, what does it really mean to be a big? Like, is Giannis really a big, right? And here's the thing. One, I'm talking about size. So that's the predominant factor. If LeBron James is your point guard, he can still be a point guard. But if he's 6'8", he's huge. So Giannis is 6'11". Two, I think if you can't play and guard successfully one of the wing or or perimeter positions if you can't guard one two or three you're a four or five you're big if you are stuck at being a four or five you are unequivocally a big so I care about size and I care about the fact that like Minnesota has guys that aren't versatile Gobert and Towns are bigs the Milwaukee Bucks Lopez and Giannis are bigs the Boston Celtics now we get a little bit more versatility but the Boston Celtics are still really a big team they don't have twin towers, but they have Porzingis, who's like 7'2", Jason Tatum, 6'8". They can go Horford and kind of play double big. He's 6'10", six, six, let's call it, and they can play him as well. But they have Drew Holiday at point guard. He's 6'3", you know, 6'5", 6'6", 6'8". Is Jason Tatum 6'8"? Is he 6'9"? How big is Jason Tatum? Why does Jason Tatum keep getting bigger? What's I think <laughs> he was listed at 6'8". I genuinely thought he was like 6'10", but also Drew Holiday makes up for like squat strength. So that he's he plays bigger than he actually is at 6'3". Okay, so next we have the aforementioned Denver Nuggets. Next we have the aforementioned Los Angeles Lakers. The next team in wins is the Orlando Magic. Has anyone checked in on how big the Orlando Magic are? Uh, Cody, they're your favorite team. Uh, can you explain to me how big they are? So the smallest player... <laughs> On their team, like on their roster, is Cole Anthony at 6'2", right? Smallest player on the roster. Nobody else is smaller than 6'4 on the team, right? Nobody else is smaller than 6'4". That's ridiculous, right? And then you have, like, I don't even know how big Boncaro is. He's like 6'10". He's, he's the biggest you know. person I've ever seen, yeah. Goga Bataze is like 6'11". You know, Franz Wagner is, I don't even know, is he 6'9", 6'10"? Like, all these guys that they play are like... 
Yeah. Yeah. Six. Jonathan Isaac, seven eight. <laughs> Um, <laughs> all these guys are just enormous. And then Jalen Suggs, he's like 6'5", plays like he's 9 foot tall. <laughs> like, these guys play with – like, I think that's the other thing. It's like playing bigger than you actually are. So the Magic are, like, not small. But then, like, Cole Anthony is, like, the toughest 6'2 guy you'll, like, come across. So it's just like you have this, like, verve and, like, toughness, and you lose nothing from, like, your guard defense because they're all just so big and so long and so disruptive. And just, like, Jalen Suggs is out there breaking his ankle, and he's still going out there. And, like, I'm going to block a shot and scare everyone and make them think that, that I ripped my Achilles in half, but I actually didn't because I'm just – God, this Magic team just rules, Ben. This is, they're big. They're big and tough. We have to do a PSA. Please, please, please. If you share a play of an injury – Please know the context before you share that play. Cody and I received a Jalen Suggs play where he injures his game the other day. I think it was the Cavs. He injures his game, uh, injures his leg in this game, holds his ankle, and all we have is this play. And we look at the replay, and it's a non-contact injury. He's jumping to block a shot. He goes down in incredible agony. He reaches right for his Achilles. And Cody and I just go, I I won't speak for you, Cody. I just go into an immediate depression. Just an immediate depression. I shut down for the evening. I am convinced that Jalen Suggs has done something terrible to his Achilles. It's a non-contact injury. You don't want to see that. It turns out that he actually injured it earlier in the game. And we, we found that play and we felt much better. But without that piece of information, uh, it was horrifying. So please, if you're sharing injuries on the internet, uh, please look for the context of the injury, J- just at least for my heart, just for the, the inner workings of my heart. Uh, ba- ba- back on track. The Oklahoma I, City yeah. Thunder. The Oklahoma City Thunder, I mean, they got Chet. Chet's a seven-footer. I don't know. Are they not huge? They're like the first team on this list where I'm like, they're not huge. We'll come back to them if you want. Philadelphia doesn't have the double bigs. At least they are built around Embiid with some big forwards. These, I'm just, I'm just reading all the top teams in the NBA by wins right now. And if you want to say, well, it's early in the season, there might be a few other contenders. Um, okay, Phoenix. I could give you Phoenix, but then we're right back in that situation where like Kevin Durant's 6'10" and he's your second biggest guy on the floor. So they're not exactly small, but I'll give you Phoenix. They're not playing double bigs. Miami's kind of a small team. And and you know where that you know where they felt that a lot in the NBA finals last year when they were just completely steamrolled by a much much bigger team. Cleveland's a double big team, the Pelicans are big. Um Cody, I'm not saying you can't win unless you're big because obviously there's the Golden State silver bullet there. I mean, there might be other ways if you have great talent and great players, but like a size is it, man, right? Size is in. I don't know if you're going to consider this to be a reductive argument. I'm, I'm just going to bring it up and see if you're interested in not, you know, we can, we could send it back to the kitchen if we want, you know, we can <laughs> toast it in the oven, throw it in a nice little cast iron, get some extra garlic in that dish. I don't know what you're going to want from this, but like how many championship teams had an, their best offensive player be under six three, and is, is, the, is Steph Curry six three? I was gonna say, so yeah. I, Steph Curry. The, let's count Steph Curry just to give them some points, just to give the small some points, right? Steph Curry is just an engine unto himself. Is, is the next player Isaiah Thomas? Like, do I think we legitimately so, yeah. go like thirty years, twenty five years between this? Like I don't I don't know if that's like a solid argument but like you don't necessarily see these teams driven by like these small guards and you know we've seen quite a few of them obviously like Allen Iverson uh carried a Philadelphia 76ers defensive squad to the finals in in 2001 you know Derrick Rose obviously we see get to the conference finals he doesn't get to the finals we just don't see a lot of these like small guys make it all the way to the finals and I do sort of think there's something to that because you know going back to even like Anthony Davis here when you have somebody like that, and even like Tyrese Halberton, six five, right? He's a good, he's a good sized guard out there that can make these passes. But when Anthony Davis is blitzing him on a pick and roll, and he's got his hands up, Tyrese Halberton can't even see passes over that. So like, I can't imagine like if you have a defense scheming against you, how you can like handle getting the looks that you want to get when you're so much shorter than some of these just gigantic teams, Ben. Yeah, I, I mean Isaiah Thomas, Steph Curry. Walt Clyde Frazier of the oh New York God. Knicks in 1970. I mean, it is a uh, very short list. Maybe 
let's see, the Bullets and the Sonics won some titles at the end of the 70s where maybe you could argue the best player offensively was one of the guards. But, uh, I mean, you know, Celtics, Celtics, Sixers. Like Gus Johnson. Yeah, 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 exactly. It'd yeah. be someone like that. Um, Gus Williams, not Gus, Gus Johnson. Gus yeah. Johnson. Yeah. I, I need Gus right. I should have stopped at Gus. I need more Gus Johnson, the basketball player, and I need more Gus Johnson, the broadcaster in my life. Um, the, the 80s were the Celtics and the Lakers, so Magic and Bird. Uh, that's where you get Isaiah. 90s, you had the, the guy, Michael Jordan. Um, the Lakers, Shaq, and Co- so, so But Kobe's 6'6". None of these guys are small. None of these guys are are 6'3". Dwayne Wade might be the closest if you count Dwayne Wade into the club in 2006. If you permit He's that so, entry. Like 6'4". Yeah, yes, yeah. 6'3 and change barefoot. Chauncey Billups of the 2004 Pistons, maybe. That's the list, Cody. That's the. This is a short list, man. That's it. That's the whole thing. So, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to make of all of that, but it does, like you were even just saying it here in the 80s, you think about the team construction of some of those players, like the 80s Lakers, like everything that's old is new, Ben. Size has always just been in. We just like NBA teams need to realize and tap into it. Like you have the 80s Lakers on, on the same lineup, Magic Johnson at point guard, or like 6'8 or whatever else, James Worthy, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Like that's a huge team. We go to the other side, the Celtics, right? Larry Bird, an enormous forward next to Kevin McHale. And Robert Parrish, like those are the kinds of size that we would see from like the Orlando Magic right now. The Twin Towers Rockets make the finals. You know, Akeem Olajuwon and Ralph Sampson. It's like a 7'4 dude and a 6'11 guy out there. Uh, two guys that just mainly play center. Like Ralph, Ralph Sampson's not 7'4. I'm just, I'm just, it has to be said. It has to be. 7'7? We, we, look, maybe back in the day, it could be permitted. He could be 7'4. But now we have a real 7'4 person in the league. And uh, I, I hate to do this. I hate I hate to be the wet blanket. But if you go look at photos, look right. at Ralph Sampson. He's probably like seven two barefoot. So you know, with the hair and the shoes, he could get away with seven four back then. But not on my watch, Cody. Not on my watch. Well, okay. So do you actually think like seven two? Do you think he's closer to like a Kareem Abdul? Okay, who's taller, Kareem or, or Ralph Sampson? I think they're very similar in height. I think Kareem Kareem might be half an inch shorter, something like that. I think there's photos of them standing next to each other. They're very similar. So who are legit seven four? Like Bill Walton wasn't quite seven four. He was no, probably like seven no. two, right? Mark Mark Eaton Mark um was there. Yao Ming. Yeah. Yao, Yao, Yao Ming was there. <laughs> I was I covered Bradley. I covered a game. I covered the Rockets once back back when I I uh moonlight moonlighted as a as a journalist in the NBA and I covered the Rockets and you walk into the locker room and like I was like staring eye to eye with Yao. I mean, I, yeah, I'm six two. I'm like staring eye to eye with Yao Ming. I'm like, this is crazy. Oh, you're sitting down in a chair. You're six <laughs> two when you're sitting in a chair. Yeah. So Yao Ming, he was pretty tall. But we're we're getting sidetracked. Let's get back on track here. And I don't know if there's anything left to say. Maybe we've maybe we exhausted this as much as we can today. But looking, you know, we just had this single elimination tournament. Looking forward to the second half of the season and the contenders, and where this is going to shake out. My thought is about size, and my thought is about the relationship between size and offense and defense. Full circle right back to the Anthony Davis thing, right? Like his his defense is not decoupled from what happens on the other end because of how it shifts the lineups. So if you're one of these, if you're Phoenix, if you're one of these, if you're Oklahoma City, if you're one of these teams that's not playing huge like twin tower lineups or something like that. How can you have a good enough defense and a good enough offense at the same time? And I think that's why having the skilled big men, having the versatile big men who can get your offense to be good or great or fit in and not be a liability while spiking the defense it is sort of, uh, you know, almost, almost like a cheat code at this point in time. And I think we're seeing that with the Thunder in the way that Chet Holmgren has fit into their their system so well like you have the rim protection right you have the ability that he go down there and protect the paint but you're not giving anything up on offense you're actually gaining stuff on offense because of his shooting ability and you know some of the passes he can make in those situations and obviously we're very excited about Victor Wembanyama, who like needs to be paired with Trey Jones more like PSA like 
Trey Jones needs to be playing on the court with Victor Wembanyama a lot more. We might be having some more interesting conversations about the Spurs if that was a thing. But like we're so excited about them because they necessarily don't take away things on offense because they can do all of these other things while still providing like the enormous sort of defensive length and versatility that we're seeing at the highest levels. And I think when you have a versatile big man, like we were also talking about like Jalen Johnson for the Hawks, when you have a strong versatile big man. That just allows you to do so many more funky things when you get to the playoffs. And I, this is like going to my Bucks bag for a second. This is what was so frustrating for a couple of those playoff series in a row when it was like they only do drop coverage. But when you have Brooke Lopez, like you're not going to be trapping out there too much with him. Like he's a drop big man. Like that's what he does. But somebody like Anthony Davis, sure, he's not as good of a drop big man as Brooke Lopez because Brooke Lopez is like an all timer in terms of that. But the actual flexibility he brings and allows you to do all these other coverages and kind of change it up and do whatever. That's that is where you get like the potency of these skilled big men. You know what I forgot to say about AD earlier that hmm. maybe puts a, a ribbon on this entire conversation. AD himself, the weakness, you know, sure, you could say outside shooting is a weakness or he doesn't have the passing chops. Uh, he flirted with the passing for a little bit, but it's it's not a huge part of the game. So you could say those are his weaknesses. But I think matchup wise, strategically, the weakness is giant opponents, huge bodies, strength. That's where the Lakers in 2020 wanted that option to play Dwight Howard, to have another big man who could, and you saw it with the Yoka strategy. Let's get LeBron or Rui, one of the guys who like is on our all leg squat team who can go and bang with the bigs. The Washington Bullets used to do this. It's the old Wes Unseld, you know, t- be the be the enforcer and have Elvin Hayes, the slender guy, be the shot blocker. Kendrick Perkins, you're the enforcer. Kevin Garnett, you roam on the weak side. And so I think you could say that if there's a strategic weakness there with him, it's more size. It's like dealing with bigger and bigger players who can stay on the court in the types of games that they play. And I just look around the, the league this year, and we may come back to this uh, later in the year, next time we do a, a full power rankings inventory or something like that as, as we approach Christmas here. And it's just like, how how are teams that aren't big going to be able to handle this? Because right away, I think the Lakers, in most playoff matchups in the West, if you can't come back at them with size, like you better have something extraordinary to be able to take out LeBron and AD when they're healthy in a playoff series precisely because of this size. The ability to exploit mismatches on one end and create high-level defense on the other. And the Rui point, too, this is what's so great about this like resurgence of Cam Reddish for the Lakers is like how are you able to squeeze out the juice of some of these big guys like Cam Reddish is a big body like a six eight type of body athletic dude that can go out there and play defense but he was just overtaxed in his previous stops right he was overtaxed when he was in his previous teams with the Hawks and whatever else and here with the Lakers when you're surrounded by guys like you know LeBron James Austin Reeves Anthony Davis guys that are going to take a lot of that offensive heavy lifting and just be like all right here's your very defined offensive role now you just need to go out there and be one of our big bodies on defense and whatever else you get so much more value out of that so I think that's another thing is like what players out there can add value and I think that's a tricky thing to try and figure out is who's actually like a good player that has a like solid frame that just needs to be at a better home that's going to fit him better and you know Cam Reddish we'll see how it goes in the playoffs but he was definitely impressive during this uh NBA cup run as well to support us and access uh, many of the stats we use to research this show throughout the year, team stats and player stats, check out patreon.com slash thinking basketball. Cody, do you have any final thoughts? Have we circled the wagons for now? We're going to come back to this later in the year. I, I'm, I thought I thought you were going to throw more uh, cold water on me today with some of my theories, but it seems like you are vibing with me that... that size is really like size is in right now you you got to be big to win it I thought I actually thought when we started this conversation that maybe you were going to come at me with like the small ball era was this whole era and my whole argument was going to be it was never actually an era we just misnamed it but you we kind of agreed on that so you know my zag ended up being our zig and yeah I, I think we're pretty much aligned with it I mean I think teams have gone smaller they absolutely have gone smaller. We've seen micro ball lineups from uh, teams beyond just the 2020 Houston Rockets. And what I mean by micro ball goes back to Cody's definition of a big. If you have a guy out there, neither of them qualify as a big. You're playing like 
Nick Batum as your center or something like that. Nick Batum can play a wing, so you don't really have any traditional big man. So we have seen that. We do know teams love trying to put wings and length out there where they can get as much skill as possible. But man, if you can get your skill from a seven foot center who's like maybe the best offensive player we've ever seen, then you're just checking boxes around your, oh, our shooting specialist is 6'11". <laughs> Mike Porter Jr. is our shoot, And Aaron Gordon, I mean, Aaron Gordon sometimes looks like he could shoulder press the entire opposing team before he dunks him into the basket. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to see what happens. You know who I think is probably most excited about this episode, Ben? The, uh, the real historical sickos that just like hearing us say names. I think there's a lot of you and I just going back and forth and saying some saying some names today. We had to rein ourselves in because it's an in-season episode. In an off-season episode, we would have gone on a whole tangent on the 1970s and the value of, uh, I don't know, Bob Dandridge or something like that. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening all the way through on this one. Hope you enjoyed it. And as always, we hope you are having a great day. <laughs>